Dr. Lilly's office is located at the UC Medical Center in Orange, California. His clinical interests are urologic malignancy, including prostate, testes, kidney, bladder, and hematologic or blood malignancy. His specialties are internal medicine, hematology, medical oncology, and hematologic oncology. Dr. Lilly is not only board certified in internal medicine, he has three board certifications. He's board certified in internal medicine, hematology, and medical oncology. As an oncologist practicing at the, practicing at the Chow Family Comprehensive Cancer Center at UC Irvine Medical Center, Dr. Lilly also directs laboratory studies on the molecular biology of enzymes generated by cancer cells to promote their own growth and survival. Dr. Lilly believes that discovering ways to inhibit these enzymes will lead to more effective chemotherapy drugs. Multiple clinical trials led by Dr. Lilly give UC Irvine Medical Center patients access to novel treatments years before they come available to the general public. Dr. Lilly is strengthening the bridge between the research lab bench and the hospital bed. He is engaged in research related to prostate cancer that does not respond to cancer vaccine treatment. Tonight, Dr. Lilly will present information about Provenge, the first FDA-approved prostate cancer vaccine. This drug has extended the life of patients with seriously advanced prostate cancer. It is a treatment for men who are asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic with metastatic, widespread, hormonal, refractory, or resistant advanced prostate cancer. Its use has very few side effects. Men now have access to ProVenge, the first cancer drug to use the body's own immune system to fight prostate cancer. Dr. Lilly will discuss the eligibility criteria for patients for whom this treatment would benefit. But he will also tell us of other cancer vaccines for more effective treatments, which hopefully will arrive soon on the scene. It is our pleasure to present to you Dr. Michael Lilly. Thank you, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here tonight. And it's an exciting time in the prostate cancer world uh, because for uh, the first time in a long time, our ability to treat prostate cancer is outstripping the ability of our insurance companies to pay for it. And uh, I guess that's a good thing. Uh, at least it's exciting that we have options. And uh, one of those options that's recently become available is the first therapeutic vaccine for any form of cancer, and that's uh, Provenge. We'll talk about that tonight and the general problems with vaccines for cancers. Uh, everyone's familiar with preventive vaccines. You get your uh, shots when you're growing up, you get that DPT shot and your measles, mumps, rubella vaccination. Those are to prevent diseases that you don't have. Therapeutic vaccines are to change the natural history of the disease you've already got. And uh, that's uh, exactly what uh, we are looking at currently in the area of vaccines for prostate cancer. You're looking at actually changing the natural history of prostate cancer that you are already battling, not preventing you from getting another one. The, uh, the field of immunotherapy is uh, a little hard to keep straight someday, so I thought I'd just 
go over just briefly. Uh, so, to understand how you go about developing an immunologic response, particularly to something like cancer, you, you need to understand who the players are. And I like to use the analogy of eating as an example. Eating is something we all have some knowledge of, and uh, perhaps you'll, you'll find it a helpful analogy. So basically, the problem with a therapeutic vaccine is you need to get your immune system to attack something that's already there, and that something uh, already has some degree of uh, tolerance from your immune system. So how do we get past that tolerance? It's a little like trying to get someone to eat something that they don't like or they're not used to eating. So, all right, let's try to get this up, get a little bit shorter. Let's think of things that you may or may not want to eat, sort of like tumor cells. And Let's think about the people who need to eat those things, somewhat like the T cells, the killer cells that are in your immune system, but obviously since your tumor has grown and they're not doing their job. There may be perfectly good reasons why you might want to eat these things up. They might be good for you, you might have someone telling you that you should do it, but the fact remains that it's not happening. And that's the problem with prostate cancer patients. So we need some way to get these things eaten up by these things. And the way we do that is we have to bring someone else into the equation. The antigen presenting cells, which function much as with a chef who serves to educate you about things that you think you don't like. So what does the chef do in trying to get these things eaten up by these things? Well, <laughs> several things, actually. First, the chef will chop up the target into little bite-sized pieces. You don't have a big blob of something, now you have lots of small blobs of something. And in, oops, in fact, the antigen-presenting cells do just that. They live in and around areas of tumor. When tumor cells die, and of course they're dying all the time, the antigen presenting cells take up those leftover proteins and chop them up into tiny little pieces. And then the antigen presenting cell presents those pieces to the surrounding T cells in some attractive manner, a manner that is attractive and it disguises those uh, structures that it's gotten from those uh, target cells in such a way that the guys that are out there trying to eat these things up, or supposed to eat them up, don't recognize them. So presentation is a very important part of the whole process. There are many ways to present things to where they don't look like the stuff they originally started out as, and yet they're much more attractive this way. The net result is happy people or happy T cells now getting a chance to experience and eat things that they didn't like before if it's just changed in some way to now it looks different in some way through the magic of the antigen presenting cell and the long term result of course is that once those T cells have been educated to learn that they like something you expect that now on their own they will go out and buy and attack the things that they formerly didn't like. That's the successful development of an immunologic response. So, what are the ways we can enhance this process to get it to work better? Because people with cancer, every one of them's got an immune system, it's just it's not working well enough. And so we need to figure out how to make it work better. Well, one way of making things uh, more attractive is to put a sauce on it. Um, you can put 
chocolate sauce on ice cream. You can put ranch dressing on vegetables. You can put a hollandaise sauce on asparagus. Sauces are things that are not the target, but they make the target more attractive. This particular approach has been used with a class of vaccines called the Tricom vaccines. These are vaccines that present antigen along with sauces that make them much more attractive. Now those sauces are immunologic molecular sauces, but they're sauces nonetheless. They're things that you add into the mix to make something much more palatable. So the Tricom vaccines function on this particular manner. They are based on the fact that those antigen presenting cells, the chef, if you will, has to give two signals to the T cell to make the T cell get excited and go hunting for those antigen producing cells all by itself. It requires that the little fragment of the food be presented to the T cell receptor, but it also requires the sauce, a co-stimulatory molecule, be presented. If you only have one of the signals, you don't get activated T cells, rather you get clonal energy. That means it gets paralyzed. The T cell doesn't do anything if it only gets one of the signals. It's got to get both signals to get buzzed up and go out there looking for cells that have that energy on it. The, uh, I'll skip over that. The Tricom vaccines are in clinical trials now. They're based on a technology developed at the National Cancer Institute, actually by a, a friend of mine named James Gully. Uh, basically, these uh, vaccines use a virus uh, to introduce into the body antigens, fragments of the food target, along with genes that encode sauces to make them much more attractive. These use pox viruses such as smallpox or foulpox viruses, because those are big viruses and you can pack a lot of stuff into them. I'll go back one. You basically have a, a piece of DNA that encodes oops, the tumor antigen, the chopped up piece of the food you want to get the cells excited about, along with genes encoding three different sauces and you package that piece of DNA into a virus and you inject it into people. And whatever cells those viruses infect right off the bat express those pieces of the, the food you want to get the cells excited to along with the three sauce molecules and the net result is an immunologic response. The greatest amount of data on the Tricom vaccines uh, is this particular phase two trial that was published uh, uh, a couple of years ago, 2009, and it looks at overall survival in patients with advanced prostate cancer who either got the vaccine or who did not get the vaccine. The net result is a very statistically significant improvement in overall survival for the virus-treated people the blue line, compared to the people who got an inactive virus, the red line. The number of responses where the PSA dropped or a tumor blob shrunk was actually quite low, 16%. However, globally, there was a substantial increase in overall survival. We'll come back to that particular point again now. Um, the Tricom vaccines are now in a phase three trial uh, that is ongoing. It will be another couple of years at least, I think, before we hear about the results of the Tricom vaccines. But the initial phase two one is certainly positive with a clinically significant endpoint, overall survival. Because everybody wants to live longer. I'll skip over that. Well, Besides making sauces, yes? Quick question. Yes? What are you considering advanced? 
advanced prostate cancer in this situation that we're talking about here basically means people who have been on hormone suppression therapy and now have something getting worse while they're on at least first line hormone suppression therapy. So you might have been on Lupron and now you have a rising PSA. That's the people who this is. Well, you said we could make some sauce. That would increase the attractiveness of those food fragments. Another is maybe we just need better chefs. You know, there are chefs out there, and then there are chefs out there. So, you want a short order cook working for you, or you want the iron chef working for you? Well, how do we uh, take these guys, who may be functioning suboptimally with paralyzed functions due to low numbers of antigen presenting cells, tumors putting out things to paralyze the effect of the antigen producing cells, drugs, intercurrent illnesses. And how do we turn those into these guys? Well, one way of doing it is to collect antigen presenting cells from the patient and put them in a dish and massage them molecularly for a few days in culture. Get them jazzed up, get them excited, get them at the peak of their game, and then you reinfuse them back into the patient. And that, in fact, is the principle behind the ProVage class of vaccines. Two different approaches to accomplish the same thing, to get a fired up chef on your team who's doing everything he can to make the unpalatable palatable. So, the ProVage approach uh, goes under the technical name Cipolucel T, and I wonder what focus group ever came up with that name. I never hear of anybody saying, boy, I'd like to sign up for Cipolucel T. Everybody says ProVinge, and I think that's what I'm going to say tonight. So the ProVinge technology involves collecting blood cells from the patient, and in those blood cells are potential antigen presenting cells. Maybe they're weak, maybe they're just functioning like a short order cook, maybe they're just not working too hard, but there's still some there. And you take them and you put them in dishes and you feed them a recombinant protein that looks like a piece of some food that you want the, the uh, killer T cells to eventually eat. So you're loading up the antigen presenting cells in a dish with their target. And after about 48 hours of proprietary care, uh, those cells are harvested, packed into a bag, put into a fancy shipping container, and brought by courier to the infusion site, where they are now considered to be mature, antigen-loaded, antigen-presenting cells. And they are now reinfused into the patient where they do what antigen-presenting cells are supposed to do. They make a beautiful presentation of something that formerly was in, uh, unpalatable, and it gets the diners all fired up to where they want to go looking for some more of that stuff at their local markets. The process is a bit cumbersome. Uh, the treatment with ProVinge involves three treatment sessions each two weeks apart. So you get session one, two weeks later you get session two, two weeks later you get session three. For each session, we've got to get some of those poorly functioning antigen presenting cells out of you and packed off to the laboratory where they can get processed. So that involves a process called leukophoresis. This is a commonly done procedure. If you've ever been a platelet donor for someone, uh, you would have undergone leukophoresis. Basically, you go to a blood collection center, such as a Red Cross center, and you have a needle put in each arm, 17 gauge needle, just like you do to donate a unit of blood. Blood comes out of one arm, and it goes to a machine that looks kind of like a small washing machine. It spins around rapidly in there, the bowl, and the white cells get slung out to a collection bag and the red cells of plasma come back to the other arm through another line. And you're hooked up for about two hours, blood continuously coming out of you, whizzing around in the bowl, the white cells get pulled off and the rest of the blood comes back to you. With a little luck, 
uh, you have an adequate number of cells, which are then picked up by a courier who uh, jumps in his, I guess now it's he jumps in his car and runs off to the processing, new processing lab in Seal Beach. Uh, and there the cells are put into culture with a proprietary mixture of growth factors and stimulants, along with these food fragments, the antigens that they're supposed to load up with so they can represent those fragments to uh, uh, T cells. Then 48 hours later, roughly, the, the courier picks up that bag and whizzes it off to the infusion center, in our case, the infusion center, the UCI Medical Center. And the patient shows up and he gets cells infused over about an hour. Two weeks later, he does the same thing. Two weeks later, he does the same thing again. And that completes the ProVinge treatment. The ProVinch treatment is, as you can see, fairly time consuming. It's not like a sort of vaccine that you just sort of take a bottle off your shelf like a tetanus shot. Uh, it's custom made from your cells just for you. And that, it's a nice special thing, but it does make it somewhat awkward. You can't just sort of say, I think I'll go get my ProVinch shot today. It takes lots of time to get it done and to make sure you're getting your stuff. Sometimes uh, a harvest of cells is not adequate. Uh, I had one patient who required nine harvests to get three usable products. That was several years ago, and I haven't heard of anyone uh, having that many harvests uh, lately. But uh, occasionally bad things can happen. People can drop things. Planes can be delayed. Uh, couriers can get lost, and there's a fairly narrow window of time for picking up products and delivering products. Um, the requirements for getting access to ProVinch are fairly stringent. You have to have hormone-resistant prostate cancer. That basically means your PSA is rising or something else is going, getting worse while you're on Lupron or having after having a, had an orchiectomy with a documented low testosterone level. You also have to have radiographically demonstrable bone or lymph node metastases, but not brain, liver, or lung metastases. And you need to be in good enough shape to where you don't need any other sort of treatment for probably three or four months, that is, you can't be someone who has rapidly expanding amounts of tumor or who's having, who is so sick that they're needing lots of narcotics uh, for pain control. So it needs to be people who are having their disease starting to sort of get bad, but it's not just acutely ill at the moment. But, you know, most people go through that fairly narrow window at some point. So the important thing is that uh, you and your physician are sort of monitoring your condition uh, if you're ever considering doing ProVinch because the, the window of opportunity can sometimes be quite narrow. Uh, we put a lot of people on the, uh, the registration study, the Dendrion 9902B study, because I had just completed a large uh, phase one study of a new drug in prostate cancer, so I had a lot of patients around that had had bone scans and, you know, had been being monitored for another study. It was very easy for them to transition on into ProVinch because we knew exactly how they were doing and, you know, we, we weren't seeing these people every six months, we were seeing them every month. So we were able to get a lot of people and sometimes that's a, a good way of doing things if you've got uh, a very narrow window during which you might be able to get uh, all the, all the I's dotted and the T's crossed to, to meet the administrative requirements. So, is it worth doing all that? Well, depends on what you mean by worse, worth it. Let's get over that. Here is the outcome from the 9902B study. So, the end point that was uh, designed for the study was an improvement in overall survival. People were not using a decrease in the PSA level as the endpoint. They weren't using a, 
you know, tied to PSA getting worse. The registration study, the one that the FDA and the company Dendrion had negotiated as the endpoint to be used for the study was overall survival. That means are, are more people alive after getting ProPinch from any cause than if they hadn't gotten ProPinch. That's considered the gold standard endpoint. You don't, it, it just doesn't get better than that if you're really uh, designing the study. Uh, that, that's a high bar to jump over because it also says, you know, if you're, what are there more people alive uh, from any cause? That means that takes into account auto accidents, brain tumors, kidney failure, heart attacks, domestic violence, and no matter what the cause of death is, there is a still a statistically significant benefit from ProBinge therapy. The green line is the people who got ProBinge, and the red line is the people who did not get ProBinge. The median survival, that is the time where 50% of people have died, is about 4.1 months longer with ProBinge. Now, say 4.1 months, that's like the space between one money visit. Um, Yes, in a sense, but there are some structural problems with the study that may have obscured the results. And I'll go right back here to this slide to show what those problems might be. The study was designed with 512 patients who had metastatic prostate cancer. That means they had positive scans. They were castrate resistant. That means they had rising PSAs or scans getting worse following Lupron or Orchiectin. And they had very few symptoms, basically nothing bad enough to need narcotics. They were randomly assigned to receive the ProVinge product or a control product. And uh, this is an example of how complicated these, cells can, these studies can be. There's obviously no placebo to having a leukophoresis done. You can't have somebody stick a 17-gauge needle in each arm and not know that you got it. <laughs> so what they did was they harvested cells on everybody, no matter which arm you were randomized to. Everybody got the same number of cells harvested. And they were picked up by the same courier and taken to the same processing lab. But when they got there, the people who were randomly assigned to the active product had their product processed in the usual way revving up the chef's performance, teaching him his uh, skills, getting him fired up to do his job. But the ones who were randomized to the control, um, they just put the cells in the freezer. Now they put two thirds of the cells in the freezer, and the other third they just put in an incubator, but didn't do anything to them. So 48 hours later, those activated or the one-third of them that were unactivated cells are returned back and infused into the patient. So things would go on. But if the patient had some evidence of getting worse after that, rising PSA, new lumps or bumps, that sort of thing, the patient could then choose to break the code and see what he had gotten. Did he get the active stuff or did he get just unprocessed cells? If he got the active stuff, we said, sorry, just didn't do much for you. But if he got the unactivated cells, he could choose then to get, sure enough, real life activated probage. And that was done by taking those two thirds of the cells that they had stuck in the freezer out and putting them in culture and stimulating them and giving them all the stuff that they would have done just like regular probage processing. So in fact, these people could wind up getting the active treatment. And that would certainly tend to minimize the difference between those two arms. So at the ASCO meeting, the American Society of Clinical Oncology meeting this year in June, they presented the results of an analysis where they looked at those people in the control arm and said, what happened depending on whether they got the active stuff or whether they chose just to get nothing. 
And so remember this picture. Now, when we put in the people who were in the control arm and who now chose or not chose to get the active product, we see a little bit different story. The solid blue line is the people who got the ProBench up front. They were randomized to the active product. The two dotted lines are the control group. The blue dotted line are the control patients who later chose to get the active vaccine. That was about two-thirds of the patients. The red line is the control group who chose not to get their activated cells to refuse to them. And you can see that the people who chose to get the activated product, even though it was delayed, they had very similar outcomes as the people who got ProVinch right off the bat, which says, you know, as long as you get it sometime, it seems to have a survival benefit. The people who chose not to get it did much worse. And now, if we look at the median survival difference, it's on the range of a year. That gets a lot more interesting. Now, the scientists among us would point out that the decision whether you're going to be in this arm or this arm was by patient choice. And that can always introduce bias. Maybe these people were very ill and just said, forget it, I give up, or something else like that. It wasn't randomly assigned, but it does raise the possibility that the effect of ProVinch is much, much more than the studies would say on the surface of it. And so uh, that's obviously something that needs to be looked at with yet another five or 10 years worth of clinical trials. So just to finish up on a summary of monotherapy vaccine trials and advanced prostate cancer. There are two ProVinch studies that have been completed in phase three. Both of them showed an improvement in overall survival for the patients who got the active product. There was no difference in terms of PSA response. In fact, the PSA response rate 